You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Thank you, everybody. It's so wonderful to be back here. Welcome back to Musser Masterclass. Tonight's topic, like every single week, is the most important topic we're going to discuss. So, why is it so important? We're talking about taking small steps. Why is it so important to take small steps? Because if you want anything to last, you need to take small steps. You want to jump? Jump. You'll fall harder. Take a small step, and it'll be much easier for you to grow. So, spiritual growth is a step-by-step process and cannot be too large a step at a time. You take a large step, you're going to fall. Guaranteed. So now we're going to talk about all we talked previous weeks about so many different traits. We talked about emuna. We talked about kindness, faith. We talked about judging people favorably. We talked about emet, truth. We talked so many traits. But now, okay, I want to internalize the traits. How am I going to succeed in internalizing those traits? Not by saying, I'm always going to judge people favorably from now on. That is not the way it's going to work. That You will not succeed that way. Neither will it work by saying, I'm going to try. Because by the time you finished the why part of the try, you forgot about what you're trying about. It's all over already. So what happens? How do we attain this tr- this these traits that we're talking about? How do we attain them and make them part of our repertoire? Make it part of who we are? I say just tell us a very, very important verse in Proverbs. King Solomon says, it is the foolishness of man who is going to jump. And then when he doesn't succeed, he blames God. He says, God, it's all your fault. You see, if you would have allowed me to succeed, I would have succeeded. But now because I fell due to my own foolishness, it's your fault, God. It's a big mistake. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example of, of making this very practical. Children, children, you have a child who tries to learn how to play an instrument. You have a child who tries a, a math equation. You have a child who's trying to overcome any type of challenge of uh, a learning curve. And they're wondering, my son, when he was learning how to play baseball, He was very frustrated that he wasn't able to play third base like Alex Bregman. He was getting frustrated that he wasn't playing as well as a major league baseball player. But you know what? That's not your job right now. Right now, you're eight years old. You need to learn how to catch like an eight-year-old. And then you'll improve a little bit and take a little step at a time. And you can't jump and try to be something that you're not. When we try to jump is we're trying to do something which is not natural to us. And that's a big mistake. So number one is don't jump. It's dangerous. And number two is that one small step for a man. Slow and steady works. Slow and steady works. The Mishnah tells us, Tafasta merubalo tafasta. This is actually the Talmud. Tafasta merubalo tafasta. You grab too much, you end up grabbing nothing. You know what? They, they have these machines where they put you in a little, little uh, like a phone booth with many hundred dollar bills. And they have this very powerful fan. And whatever you get, by the time you're done, you can keep. And everybody walks out empty handed. You know why? Because everybody tries to grab everything. Instead of trying to just grab one. If you focused on just grabbing one, you would succeed. But you're trying to grab everything. Oh, no wonder you're not successful. Tafasta Marubala Tafasta. You try to grab too much, you don't get anything. I think the greatest example of this is the Dafyomi. Dafyomi isn't, you know, let's cram it all in, let's do 30 pages in one day. No. Let's do 30 pages in 30 days. Do one a day, take one page of Talmud, and study the one page of Talmud. Don't do, oh, once every seven days, I'll do seven pages, and then I'll. It doesn't work. 
It's not about taking big steps. You're not expected to do too much. God doesn't expect us to do more than we're capable of doing. He expects us to do what we're capable of doing. If it's unnatural, it won't last. That's a guarantee. Do you want someone who's going to overexert themselves as an employee working for you? Who wants to hire someone who's going to overexert themselves and push themselves to the max? Nobody wants such an employee. You know why? They're going to burn out and it's not going to last. It's very interesting that when we talk about when we talk about Jacob, Jacob was traveling and then he went to sleep. He arrived at the place. What's the place? The Temple Mount. He arrived at the Temple Mount and he went to sleep. We know he put the stones around his head. These are the 12 tribes, all prophecy. And then he has a dream. What's the dream? He has the ladder. And on the ladder, there's angels going up and down. Our sages ask, why does he need a ladder? Angels don't need ladders. So why in the world is God putting in Jacob's dream a ladder? To tell us that any time you're trying to grow, you need a step-by-step approach. Don't try to grow too much too fast. Even the angels in Jacob's dream were teaching us this lesson of take a one step at a time approach. That's what you need to do. Take one step at a time. It's interesting that um, comparing yourself to someone else is very unhealthy. Ever. You know, one of the great Hasidic rabbis inherited his father's position after his father passed away, but he was very young. I think he was 12 years old. And he became the leader of an entire dynasty of Hasidic followers. It's a very prestigious position. And the, 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 uh, I guess the assistance to the Rebbe, the assistance to the grandmaster of that Hasidic court, they said, you know, you're so young. We're much older than you. How can you lead us? So he says, you know, there was once a hiker that was hiking up a mountain. He gets higher and higher. Finally, after years and years, is getting up to the top of the mountain. He can't wait for the view that he's going to see at the top of the mountain. He finally gets to the top of the mountain and he sees a little baby. He says, I I, I don't believe it. Look at all my white hairs. I've been struggling and struggling to get to the top of the mountain. And here you are, a little baby. How did you get here? He says, no, no, no. I was born here. And that's what this Rebbe, this new Rebbe said. He says, yeah, you may be working for many, many years to attain certain levels, but I was born on the top of the mountain. And it's not a point of arrogance. It's a point of fact. There are people who are given different virtues, different qualities that render them with leadership skills, with with certain talents, with certain abilities. Every single one of us here, every single one in this room and online, and it per, and every person listening to this podcast, guess what? You're given a special talent that's unique to you. And you are excellent in something. Don't try to compare yourself to someone else and say, hey, why do they have that virtue and I don't? You have a virtue that they don't either have. Everyone is given a different basket of fruit. Everyone is given a different set of, of, of tools to work with. And an electrician doesn't ask, how come I don't have the tools of a, of a plumber? Well, your job is different. Right? If you had the tools of a plumber, you wouldn't be able to do your electrical work. And if he had your tools, he wouldn't be able to do his plumbing work. And the same with a surgeon and a dentist. Everyone has the tools that's right for them. Guess what? Each and every one of us have our own unique tools that are specific to us, that are tailor-made for us, which Hashem gave us to accomplish what we need to accomplish in this world. So looking at someone else is not understanding our mission. It's not understanding our purpose. Some people are just born 
great in a specific area. And they should shine in those years. You need to find, each one of us need to find what we were born great as and shine in that area. It may not be as glamorous as the person in Hollywood. It may not be as glamorous as the person, you know, who's running the country or uh, as great as the person who won the Olympic uh, gold medal. Every person has the tools they need to maximize their life. You know, it's an amazing thing. We have, the Mishnah tells us something really remarkable. It says, We toil and they toil. We toil and receive reward. They toil and don't receive reward. What do you mean they don't receive reward? What, is that? what does this whole, this whole Mishnah tell us? Sages tell us as follows. The Chavetz Chaim explains this and says, we don't get reward based on our results. We get reward based on our efforts. So if someone were to hire a plumber, you hire a plumber, you say, I have a leaky sink, can you please help me? Comes, he says, it's going to cost $500. Okay, sure, no problem, just fix the, fix the, the faucet. He comes, he fixes, he comes to, to fix the faucet. He gets under there, he takes everything out, makes a big mess in your kitchen. And, you know, he's under the sink and he's toying around with things, takes it apart, puts it together, takes it apart. He says, oh, I need to get a tool. I need to get something from uh, Home Depot. I'll be back in a few minutes. He goes to Home Depot, comes back an hour later. He's still trying, trying this, trying that. At the end of the day, it's still leaking. And he says, I tried everything I can do. Please make sure to pay your invoice, $500. Who's going to pay him? We don't pay him. What do you mean? I'm a, I'm a, I didn't ask you to work hard. I asked you to fix it. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get the job done, you're not getting paid. But what happens if someone sits in the study hall and studies Torah for 10 hours? They're sitting and trying to learn the Talmud and they don't understand it. They don't get it. Do they get rewarded for those 10 hours? Even though they don't have any res- they don't have anything to show for it. You can't give a lecture on it. You can't explain it to anyone else. Why are you getting a reward? Because in Judaism, the number one principle in Judaism, the number one principle in Judaism is we reward effort, not results. We don't care about results. God doesn't care about results. God cares about your efforts. You put forward an effort, that's what counts. And this gives us a sense of encouragement when we're trying to take a step of growth. Don't expect to succeed and that be your reward. Put forward an effort and that is the reward. I'm going to try. I'm going to put forward an effort. I'm going to try my best. And that's it. And now, you're not expected to do more. Now, we're expected to continue trying. And continue trying. It says, Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor. Aval iyata ben chorin lihibatel mimeno. This is one of my favorite missions of all the, the ethics of our fathers. Pirkei Avos. This one Mishnah tells us, Lo alecha hamlacha ligmor. Your job is not to complete the task. But you're not allowed to ever stop. You're not allowed to ever give up hope. You're not allowed to ever stop trying to attain perfection. Will I ever attain perfection? I don't know, but I'm never going to stop trying. Your job is to continue. I'll give you an example. So someone is pursuing losing weight. Trying to lose weight. I want to get to my ideal weight. I keep trying and I keep failing, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to give up. No. Your job is to never stop. Your job is not to succeed. Your job is to never stop trying to pursue perfection. That's our job. So a person can never say and should never say, it's un-Jewish for one to say, I tried, I failed, I'm done. 
Moshe, Moshe had every excuse in the world not to be the Jewish leader. He had every excuse in the book. God says, your job is not to be a perfect leader. Your job is to never stop trying. That's your job. So, just remember that buildings are not built in one day. Buildings are built one brick at a time. You know what? When you start that building and you look at that brick, you're like, oh, it's never going to get built. It's never going to get built. Look, there's only one brick. But you know what happens after a day? You have two rows. And that, that's true. Okay, we'll, we'll see. We'll see in a minute that we'll, that that the most important part is putting the effort. The success will come because Hashem provides a special siyata uh, a special assistance. But we'll get to that in a minute. But when a person tries to build, there's no instant technique of how to build a building. But there is absolutely a step-by-step process that needs to be followed. You put one brick after another brick after another brick, and before you know it, you'll have a building done. So, the Talmud says that when a person performs a mitzvah, it might appear to be something which is completely insignificant in his own eyes. Give me an example. Lighting Shabbos candles. Hey, how important is it? Okay, it's a simple, you just light candles. So if I don't do it, what's the big deal? Our sages tell us, in the eyes of God, however, it is something very great because the action of this mitzvah that is done on earth awakens spiritual roots in heaven. Every single physical action that we do in this world awakens up powers in the upper worlds. And we must know that its spirituality in heaven knows no bounds nor limits. Yes, yeah, so a while in this world I'm saying, huh, there's no results, bottom line, it's not working for me. I keep trying, I keep failing. You know what you've created up in heaven? Every time you tried, Every time you tried performing that mitzvah, you've created worlds in the heavens. That is why it says, if a man sanctifies himself a little, they sanctify him a lot. Why? Because in this world, it seems a little. Oh, I tried. It didn't work. In the, in the, in the, in the heavens, you created worlds. It's something which is so important. The Talmud says another amazing thing. It says that a person should always live their life as if it's on the scales of balance, the scales of life. So imagine this. I do one mitzvah, what happens? I'm on that scale, it's even, even score. Now I do one mitzvah, one, not a lot, one mitzvah, what happens? I already weighed it down to the mitzvah side. One mitzvah. So if a person is contemplating one second, should I do this mitzvah? Should I not do this mitzvah? Right? I've heard many times, by the way, very, very, very important thing to discuss. I don't know why we, we, we haven't discussed this in a long time. You know that there's several major misconceptions that Jews have about Judaism. One of those misconceptions is that it's all or nothing. I've heard people tell me, Rabbi, it's so hypocritical for me to not do something on Shabbos or to not do this. Rabbi, I eat pork. I mean, who am I kidding? I'm trying to be all holy about this thing, but there I'm living like that. It's hypocritical. I can't do this, Rabbi. Guess what? In Judaism, it's not all or nothing. It's not all or nothing. Every single step counts and you have no idea you have no idea how changing a person's a single change in a person's life can transform their entire life that one change i'll give you an example my mother-in-law i said the story before but i love the story so much my mother-in-law had a study partner that she learned with Every single week, she would learn together in Partners in Torah. Those of you who don't know, Partners in Torah is an excellent organization that partners up 
people to learn together. You can learn any topic that you want. You can call them up today, tomorrow, 1-800-STUDY-42, four, the number four, the number two, and they will partner you up to learn with someone. So my mother-in-law had a study partner who was completely, completely secular. And she told her, you know, it's coming, the holiday of Pesach is coming, and as you know, in a Jewish household, Pesach is a, is a big deal. And I'm not going to be able to learn for the next couple of weeks because we're cleaning the house for Pesach. And then we have Pesach. And then after Pesach, getting the house back in order. So for the next four or five weeks, we're not going to learn together. She says, oh, it's very interesting. But what is Pesach exactly? She says, okay, I can't get into the whole thing. The Jewish people left Egypt. Bottom line is we don't eat bread for these seven days. Okay, bottom line, we don't eat bread uh, for these uh, actually eight days in the diaspora. Okay, so for these eight days, we don't eat bread. Okay, she didn't get into too much detail. She was a beginner. And um, sure enough, they, they stopped learning. When they started learning again, when they got back together, this lady says, oh, so how was your Pesach? She says, oh, it was very nice. The family got together. It was very nice. How was your Pesach? She says, oh, you're not going to believe it. It was amazing. She says, one of the days of Pesach, I picked up my kids from school, and they were very hungry. So we went to McDonald's, and we picked up their uh, their cheeseburger. And she says, I'll tell you, I scratched off every last piece of their bread because you're not allowed to have bread on Pesach. So I took every drop of bread off their cheeseburger. And you know what? The heavens were smiling, and the heavens... <laughs> said, ah, look at my children, look how righteous they are. What do you mean, Rabbi? She was eating a cheeseburger, and you're telling me the heavens were smiling? Yes, because that was her step. That was her step. And not to spoil the story, and not to uh, be, what do you call it when you take away the, the, the punchline from the thing? Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, okay? Yeah, she became religious with her entire family. And who knows if it wasn't the merit of that bread that she scratched off their cheeseburger. That commitment of one mitzvah can change a person's life. Oh, but me? Who am I? What do you mean? Me? So hypocritical for me. Dumb. It's one small step. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll tell you you what he's saying. What he's saying is very nice, Rabbi. In Judaism, that might work, but that doesn't work when you're selling cars for Toyota. Right when they say, "Hey, go sell some cars," and you go and you're like, "I spoke, I spoke to 200 people today, and how many cars did you sell? Zero. What's your answer to that? The answer to that is, Hashem will have have to help you succeed in a different area, because that's the way it works. That's the way it does work. But some people are highly successful in that area. That's true, and Hashem succeeds their way, and and there there are many. Many people who won't succeed in that job. And if Hashem wants you to succeed, you can succeed in selling. I met a guy, I met a guy a couple of weeks ago. This individual, it's interesting. It's like never give up hope. This is a guy I was introduced to 12 years ago. Someone gave me his information. He said, call the guy up. I think he's interested in Judaism. Get connected with him. I called him up. He says, listen to me, Rabbi. Okay. Don't ever call me again. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. I'm not interested in Judaism. Leave me alone. Lose my number. Forget my name. Goodbye. Just two weeks ago, a guy sends me an email. He says, oh, I have a guy I do some business with. He says, why don't you give him a call? I think he might be interested. I, and I, I remember the name. I'm like, I, I remember this name. I remember this name. I searched my records. I'm like, do not call him is what it says on the notes, right? I'm like, but you know what? I'm going to give it a shot because we don't give up on anyone, right? That's what Hashem tells us to do. You got to give it a shot, give it a try. I call him up and he's like, hey, Rabbi, when are you coming over? I said, I'll be there tomorrow. What time is good for you? And we schedule a time and I went to meet with him. What does the guy do? You think, what does the guy do? For a livelihood, I met him in his office. He buys junk. I'm talking about all junk. No, whatever. You have a, a, a T-shirt business. You have a thousand shirts. Oh, you have nothing bulk, to do with bulk. bulk. All the exactly all the discount stuff. And it's like, 
And you think, you think like, like, what, yeah. what's, what's your job, right? What's your job? I do, uh, you know, they used to call it, the, I'm in the shmata business, <laughs> right? The shmata business was the, you know, people the would buy, what? Binders, but bulk of it. Exactly. Right. Whatever it is, anything. Either way, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Because this guy probably would, couldn't sell you a car in the Toyota lot for anything. He wouldn't be able to. But Hashem gives every person, every single person, the thing that's right for them. That they can succeed in. That's perfect for them. And guess what? If everyone would be a doctor, you wouldn't have nurses. If everyone would be nurses, you wouldn't have uh, uh, Uber drivers. And if everyone was an Uber driver... Hashem gives everyone the right thing that's right for them. And if you know it, if you try something and it doesn't work for you, maybe it's not the right thing for you. Try something else. So that's my answer to your question, Dave. Hashem will send you the right thing, which is the absolute perfect solution for you. Okay? But when someone studies Torah, you know, is wouldn't it be easy for everyone to just get a good job and make a good living and, and that's it. And, and everything will go smoothly. No, because then you're not going to be tested with your emunah. And then you're not going to be tested with your character. How are you going to become great in your overcoming of anger, let's say, if you're never tested with your anger? If everything just worked as you wanted it? How would a person work on their arrogance if they didn't get married? You need a wife to put you into place. Okay. Seems like everybody here agrees. <laughs> I want to I want to read to you a pasuk uh, verse that I'm just being rem- I'm re- reminded of right now in Vayelech. Vayelech is in it's the last day that Moshe's Moshe's living, and he's giving his parting words to the Jewish people. He says, "Listen to the voice of Hashem, follow his mitzvahs, his commandments, and his laws." That are written in this Torah. When you shall return to Hashem, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. Key. Four. This commandment that I command you today, which is to have repentance, to connect to the Almighty, is not hidden from you and it is not distant. It is not in the heaven for you to say, who can ascend to the heaven for us and take it for us? So that we can listen to it and perform it. I can't, I'm not going to the heavens. So who can go up to the heavens to get the Torah for us? Or whatever this mitzvah is. Nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us and take it for us? So that we can listen to it and perform it. Must be really great, right? So distant. It's so heavenly. It's so, it's insurmountable. We can't, we can't attain it. Rather, the matter is near to you. In your mouth and in your heart to perform it. All you need is to have the will. So we discussed last week about willpower. Two weeks ago, we discussed willpower. Guess what? All we need is the willpower. The desire in our heart and our mouth, like we mentioned last uh, two weeks ago, Every word that we say, we mentioned last uh, two weeks ago, we mentioned that every word that a person says creates an angel. Creates an angel. If you really desire something and you talk about it, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart, you desire it and you speak it out. You know what will happen? You're creating those angels that will help you succeed in it. So anything that you want to accomplish, you want to lose weight, talk it out. Say, Hashem, I need your help. But in a practical level, I want to turn your attention for a minute to a very, very important book. It's called Atomic Habits. I love this book. Okay, Atomic Habits. So I I want to give you an example. I want to give you an example of how we can... So his, his theory, and I agree with his theory, it's actually sourced in what our sages write. And they talk about change, and they should take small steps. Here's the challenge. Who is the police looking for? My daughter called me today. She's driving in New York. And she said, you know, I know Texas. I know what the highway, you know, rules are. You know, it's like you have 65 speed limit. You drive 75, they're not stopping you in Houston. But in New York, 
you know, it's 55 speed limit and she's driving, you know, she's trying to figure out what, what are they going to. So I said, in New York, if you drive two miles over the speed limit, they're going to stop you. Okay, it's New York. And they have cameras and they'll take pictures and mail it to you and it's like, it's a mess. So who are they looking for in Texas, right? They're not looking for the guy who's going two, three miles over the speed limit. They're looking for the big shot who's driving 85 down the down the through you know down the the speedway right it's you know 65 he's going 85 flying by everyone that's the guy they're going to get they're looking for the big fish the guy who goes 2 3 miles over the speed and leave him alone the etzara is the same thing the etzara says ah, i don't care about the guy who's just making small changes in his life show me the guy who wants to change everything He's going to change his diet overnight. He's going to lose weight overnight. Everything overnight. And these are the guys that the Yitzhara says, this is the guy I'm looking for. Let me, let me chop him up. So our sages tell us, in order, in order to make change in your life, you know what you need to do? Very important. Don't jump. Don't jump. Take it easy. And take a small step at a time. So the, let's give an example. I have over here a few examples from that book that I share, that I want to share with everyone. So imagine you want to start exercising so that you can lose weight. So the first thing you need to do, and this is, I, I, I think this is a very important process. The first thing we need, phase number one, I do this all the time, is change into your workout clothes. Phase number one, change into your workout clothes. You know what? You may not go working out. You may not end up working out. Change into your workout clothes. You know phase number two? Phase number two is leave your home. Get out. Get outside. Even if you take a walk around the block and it's a slow walk, step number one. Step number two. Step number one, change your clothes. Get into workout clothes. Step, we're not talking about losing weight yet. We're not talking about getting into, you know, running the marathon. Just change your clothes. Get into your workout clothes. Put on your sneakers. Small step. Small, 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 small step. Next small step is leave your house. Just go outside. Walk around the block. Something small. Step number three. Phase number three. Go to the gym for five minutes. Five minutes. Now, what does everyone try to do? Oh, I'm, I'm on a new workout regimen. I'm going to work out for an hour and a half, right? And that's the last time you show up in the gym. And that's how Planet Fitness makes so much money. It's for all of those people who say New Year's Eve, I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year. I want to look my best. It's hard. You know why it's hard? Because we're thinking at the end zone. We think, it's like, imagine this. I'll tell you why Tom Brady's the best quarterback in football history. You know why? I don't know why. But I'm just guessing. Because he doesn't try to make big plays. Let's get our yardage that we need to get our first down. You know these young whippersnapper quarterbacks, they're like, oh, I, every, every, every throw is going to be into the end zone. Everyone's going to be a Hail Mary. Everyone's going to be all the way down. They're going to be like, whoa, what an arm this guy has. So you go to the gym for five minutes. That's step number three. Step number four, exercise for 15 minutes each day. 15 minutes each day. You see, you're trying to push to the end zone. That's the, that's the mistake. And the last thing, phase number five, is exercise three times a week. Three. Three times a week. Because you know what will happen? Here's the thing. If you try to do too much, the Yetzirah will knock you down. You're an easy target. But when you start with something small, he says, oh, you put on your sneakers, big deal. Big deal. Put out your workout, your workout shoes. It's not a big deal. I'll tell you the first thing I did in my diet. And I'll tell you what. I am frustrated. I didn't lose enough weight. Thank you. I appreciate that. You look great too. But but I didn't lose as much as I wanted to lose yet. And I, I think I should have lost already much more than I did. But you know what? It takes discipline. We'll talk about this off here, you know, plenty. But let me tell you the first thing I did. What is the easiest habit you can change 
that doesn't take a lot of work. I think the easiest thing, cut out the sugar drinks. Cut out the sugar drinks. Okay? It's something small. It's not a big deal. Cut them all out. So you know what I do? I stop buying them. I stop buying them. I always have cold water in my house. I always have cold water bottles in every fridge. I want cold water bottles. So that way I'm not tempted to go for the cold can of Coke. That's so refreshing. I go for the cold water bottle. Let's talk about a a different habit that we want to change. You want to go to sleep earlier. Why? So that you can wake up earlier. Okay, that's very important. So how do we do that? So set yourself a time. Would that time be, let's say, 10 o'clock, random time, 10 o'clock, 10.30, whatever, whatever time it works for you. Phase one, be home by that time. Be home by that time. Phase two, right, but, but, right, right, but the idea is, the idea, the idea is, the idea is, is you want to take a step, a step. That time is your, is your, uh, is your framework that you're working with, the time. So whatever time you pick, let's say 10 o'clock. So 10 o'clock, you're home, okay? So you do that for a couple of weeks. You're home by 10. The next step would be, let's say, turn off all your devices by 10 o'clock. So now I'm home already by 10. I'm going to turn off my devices by 10. The next would be to be in bed by 10. Now, we're not saying it. This could be three months out. You're still not going to sleep at 10 o'clock. But you built new habits that are easy habits, and you didn't rush into them. Because what people like to do is, you know what? I'm going to sleep at 9 o'clock. I'm starting a new schedule. And that lasts one night. First, be home at 10 o'clock every night. Then, one step at a time, okay? Then, wake up eight hours later. So you wake up at 6 a.m. And then... Phase five would be turn the lights off by 10 o'clock. So what you do is you slowly, slowly integrate new easy habits. But there's something more important. Something much more important is if you're able to attach your change with something that already exists, it's the easiest. So let's say our dear friend here is wants to deal with weight loss. Ah, How do I do it? Well, here's the one thing that you do every single day. You eat. You're doing that every day. So if you're already eating, you can attach a good habit to it. Okay, because what do we do? We do the habit that is most comfortable for us or that's most enjoyable for us. But what's if I can change that habit a teeny little bit I changed that habit a teeny little bit. And now, instead of me just eating my lunch, I'm going to eat a better lunch. I'm going to eat my lunch, but I'm going to eat a healthier lunch. That doesn't mean that I'm starting with salads. It doesn't mean that, but you know what? I'm going to, and all it takes is changing a little habit to something that already exists. It's already there. So I, I think I, I think it's it's something something that is small steps. Small steps like, what's if you were to buy yourself some snacks so that you don't come to that third whatever meal that you're having at night starving and that you just devour everything you see, okay? I mean, I'll give you an example. My, my grandfather used to say to his students, never walk into your house hungry because the first 20 minutes when you arrive at home don't belong to you. They belong to your wife. If you come home from a hard day at work, You want to come home and be treated like a king and sit by the table and have a delicious steak dinner. But guess what? You got 14 kids hanging from the chandeliers. (laughs) And they're killing each other, fighting with each other. And there's no dinner in sight. And there's a mother worn out, tired. The first 20 minutes belong to her. But I'm starving. Well, don't come home starving. Eat eat an apple on the way home. Eat something before you knock knock on that door and enter into your home. Just a reminder, the halacha says that before you walk into your own home, you have to knock on the door. 
It's my house. Yes. No surprises. Except for birthdays. So the, how long does each phase take? The, that's also something. It, it's, it, but here's the thing. One second, one second. The issue is, I think the biggest issue is, is that we, you and I, okay, who are facing the same challenge, and I identify with your challenge wholeheartedly, is that we both think about it. In 60 days, I'll lose all my weight. In 80 days, I'll lose all my weight. And the thing is, it's not, it doesn't go like that. It's changing the habits of how we eat slowly, consist, consistently, so that not that I lose the weight, is that I become more healthy. That's the goal. How do I become more healthy? In the process, we'll also lose weight. So it's not about, oh, I'm just going to drop my weight. I'm going to go from 250 pounds to 200 pounds in three months. And it's not going to happen in three months. I'm sorry. Not going to happen. And those who lose it fast, gain it fast. But if I can change and say, you know what? I'm going to introduce something healthy into my meal. I'll take something that's unhealthy out of my meal. No, I'm not saying you go from a big piece of chocolate cake to a broccoli salad. I'm, what I'm saying is, have your chocolate cake, but take a much smaller piece of the chocolate cake. I mean, you know, the Yetzirah, the way he works is, when you appease him a little bit, he lets go. He says, oh, I got him. I got him. No, you didn't get me. I gave, like today, I I tried to trick my Yetzirah, Right? I had a little barbecue potato chips. Don't say, right? Don't tell anyone. And that's against my diet. I don't eat that stuff. But you know what? The bottom line is that every person is different and every person has to find the thing that works for them. Okay, one second. So I say introduce something healthy to your day. Okay? It's a long process. We don't change overnight. And I think weight loss is the best example. It's the best example. Because it's something that every single human being is conscientious of if they want to stay healthy and fit. It's not, the issue is not being fit. The issue is being healthy. And we want to make sure that we eat right, we sleep right. These are all healthy. Okay, so yes, for every trait that you try to acquire, you will need to use this small step process. Very small step. I'll give you, an, I'll give you another example. One of my big challenges is studying the daily folio of Talmud, the Daf Yomi. It's a big challenge. Unless I do one thing. I'm praying the morning services every day anyway, right? That's a solid. That's a solid, consistent activity that I do every day. So if I attach my learning with that, it makes it much easier. I'm not creating a new habit. I'm changing an existing habit, okay? Until it becomes, and it might be a struggle, and it is a little bit of a struggle. I'm, I'm now 19 days into this, and it's not the easiest thing, and I'm not always able to. I'm not always able to. Sometimes I have a, something comes up. I have an emergency. I have a meeting. I have to go, right? And I don't have that, that same, okay, but I am trying to attach it to something which is a constant. Prayer, the morning prayers, the afternoon, evening prayers are a constant. And therefore, it's easier to attach something to it. So it says, it says that Yudea Tzadik Nefesh Behem To, a righteous person knows the nature of his animal. Our sages tell us a righteous person knows himself. You're the animal. You need to know yourself. Forget about knowing your animal. You'll figure out your animal later. Do you know yourself? Do you know yourself, right? We have to know what we're capable of and what we're not capable of. We have to remember that we can't either grow too slowly. You know, an airplane needs something called lift in order to stay in the air. It has to be moving fast enough to stay afloat. And if it doesn't, what will happen? It will stall. And that could be very dangerous. It's very important. You need to have momentum. A person who completely pulls the handbrake and stops and says, well, you have to go slow, so I'm just going to stop. And that way, no. That's a person, an, a living human being, a living creation of the Almighty needs to always be moving. The world is always turning. 
The world is always turning. The world doesn't stop turning for one millisecond. That's ex that's an example to us, which is why when someone passes away, we eat round foods. We eat eggs. We eat round foods. Yes. After someone, the, the family, when they, it's called the Suda Savra, just after the funeral, the family of the mourners get together and they have a meal where they eat round foods. Why do they eat round foods? Our sages tell us because it's to remind us, guess what? Everything comes and goes. Everything. It, it's, it, we're cyclical. We come and we go. Someone else will continue another time for us. Right? And therefore, chop, chop. It's time to, to, to buckle up and, and get things done because we don't have all day. We don't have forever. We have right now. We're on this side of the grass. We got work to do. It's reminding everything Hashem created is round. Think of every vegetable. Think of every fruit. Think of the world, the globe, the trees. Everything is round. Why is everything round? The donuts, right? Exactly. Why? Why is everything round? Why did Hashem create? We created square. Why did Hashem create everything round? Because to remind us constantly that everything that you look at, guess what? You'll be one time finishing that circle and life is over. Life is a circle. And guess what? We're not here forever. We don't go straight and it be infinite. We don't live infinitely. Our soul does. Our body doesn't. And we need that constant reminder. So in this life, which is a circle, take a step. What type of step? Small enough that it's almost insignificant. Because one small insignificant step and another small insignificant step and another small insignificant, insignificant step makes a remarkable step. And a person who's able to change one thing and stick to that one small thing. I'm not talking about something which is difficult. Because the minute you introduce something difficult, it's gone. So if you add something to your diet, said diet, that's difficult, forget it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You have to do something that's easy for you to do. Almost laughably easy. Easy. I had a woman come over to me and she says, Rabbi, I'm ready to keep Shabbos. Tell me where to start. What should I do? So I told her, I've said this story before. I told her, take one light switch that you don't turn on or off. She started laughing. She says, that's so easy. I said, great. Then that's what you need to do. And it wasn't more than a year later that she was completely Shomer Shabbos. It's, it, and, and it's not the only person. I had many students like that. One small something, because that one small something builds the energy that you have now another small something. Because think of the alternative. You say, okay, don't use any electricity that's not preset before Shabbos. You can't cook on Shabbos. You can't drive on Shabbos. You can't this. They're like, huh? Right? It's done. I'm out. Goodbye. I'm done. All right? I'll try something else. I'll pick up tennis. Right? I'm not doing that. Right? The, the idea is, and by the way, it's also an amazing thing. When you talk about athletes, when you talk about athletes and they have coaches and the coaches tell them to adjust how they're holding the bat or adjust how they're, how they're pitching just by one little adjustment, something so small. Don't try to change everything. Don't try to change everything. You have your habits, you have your things. Let's make small adjustments. Very, very, very small. It's so critical that we focus on, on things that are small. The healthy way to grow is to take step by step. Don't try to jump. Because then what's going to happen? We brought from, from uh, Mishle, from Proverbs, where King Solomon says that it's your stupidity, your foolishness, that says, I'm going to jump, and then you're going to fail, and then you're going to ask, where was God? Why didn't he help me? I, after all, I was doing this for him. After all, I did it because I wanted to serve God. Why didn't he help me? You jumped. It's your fault. Don't jump. How many times do we want to become perfect in something? I know this, but just by the way, you know, I, I learned when I was a child, I learned a musical instrument. And 
I you see, I, I'm an all in guy, or I'm all out. I'm not. I, there's no. Th- I'm an extremist. Okay, I really am. I'm like I'm either all in something or I'm all out. So and I, that's the way I am with everything. So I'll give you an example. When I was in um, in yeshiva, I wanted to teach myself during the days off during the between semesters. Uh, I would have 30 days off between the beginning of the month of Nisan to the end of the month of Nisan for Pesach, right? The holiday of Pesach was in between. So I would go on that first day of Nisan, I would go to the library, and I'd pick out a book on any topic I wanted to explore, like I did computer networking, I did web design, I did graphic graphic, uh, graphic design, I did, uh, you know, all of these technology stuff, um, I did uh, how to conduct an orchestra. Yeah, yeah, you didn't know that, right? <laughs> All of these little things. And the thing is that, that I'll happily teach you how to blow a shopper. So I'm an all-in guy. So if I try something, I don't just like dabble in it. I'm either all in or I'm all out. Okay, so like when I got into I'll tell you. And the worst thing a person can do is tell me, oh, you're never going to do it. Mm-hmm. Right, because then I'll, then I'll show you. So I remember I was once sitting at the window of a yeshiva and I see outside the building, there was a guy riding a unicycle and I was ta- completely enamored by it. So I told my brother, oh, I'm going to learn how to ride a unicycle. He says to me, yeah, after you break your head, right? And it's like, and he's like, it's, you're never going to learn. And I, anyway, I asked him, I said, can you give me your friend's phone number? The guy who has the, says he's never going to lend it to you. I called him up. I said, can I borrow your unicycle? He says, sure. And, and that day, I spent six to eight hours nonstop getting up, falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up, falling down, like the entire day, <laughs> up and down, until the end of that day, I did 30 feet on the unicycle. And the next day, I rode a mile. And I brought him back his unicycle. He's like, oh, you broke your legs? You broke your head? What did you do? I said, no, no, no. I learned how to ride it. He says, what? In one day? I'm like yes, in one day, like you know, I, w- I wasn't going to go to sleep. So when I learned how to had a, had a drum, I I learned how to drum, and it was it was it was it was a process. But there was some I, I would try to play along with music, and then if I'd get to music that was too fast, or I'd get so frustrated that I wasn't able to do it yet. I was so frustrated, not that I wasn't able to do it yet. It seemed to me like it was going to be impossible for it to ever happen. And I kept trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And I was so frustrated. I remember there were times I'd just take the sticks and just like, I'm done. Okay? okay. But you know what? One day, out of, out of no place, I suddenly was able to do it. Because you try and you try and you try. And Hashem succeeds your way if He wants you to succeed. And if He doesn't want you to succeed, you're not going to succeed a thousand times trying. And that's the bottom line. Is that our job is to never stop trying. That's our job. I don't know how to con- conduct an orchestra anymore, but I once did. So too bad. Um, it's not. I, I'll tell you that I had to. One well, the idea is is that you have to make sure that everybody is together in unity, sure, and that everyone's got everyone's got a part to play, and everybody's important, and is there like a and, that and, and that everybody. It's a very important thing in life is that everybody's got something to offer. So while the guy who's playing the violin doesn't realize that his uh, part is important, right? You have to have every piece needs to be in the right place at the right time. And then together, it's beauty. And the more you're able to have that u- that unified sound, because you think anybody can just stand up there and just wave a baton and they're like, you know, it's not a big deal. No, it's not. It's not the, and, and you see that there are different conductors that bring different energy to their musicians. It's not just that they're playing the notes. It's not dry notes. It depends the life that you put into it. So it's like that in everything in life. You can have different employers. What's the big deal? Just do your job and that's it. No. But there are people who inspire you to want to excel. Okay? There are people who take away your energy because they don't know how to compliment. They don't know how to make you feel good. They don't know how to excite you and build the dream in everyone's mind. Mm-hmm. Maestro Wolpe. Yeah, that's fine. You can call me Maestro. But I'll tell you like this. I, I, there was a, there was, the, okay, so this is more of becoming like a, a homey class here. So it's good. I'll have to do a lot of editing. But either way, so, 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 so
So <laughs> this happened in Houston. This is probably 12, 13 years ago. Um, one of my students called me up and he said to me, Rabbi, I really would like you to officiate my wedding. I said, oh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to. And then we were talking about the schedule of the wedding and everything. He says, oh, by the way, I also wanted to ask you a different question. I know you're going to think it's odd, but would you also be the drummer? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I called my rabbi and I'm like, I think I might be more excited about doing the drumming than being the rabbi. <laughs> so my rabbi said, it's time, it's time to hang up that hat. So, uh, you know, prior to that, I did, I did, I did many concerts and I did weddings and I did things like that. But you know what? When I picked the career of being a rabbi, I had to take the drumming. Now, yeah, will I drum every once in a while? I do. I have my drum set, and every once in a while, I'll, 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 I'll pull it out. But it's like the truth is, is that so, sometimes you just have to close the file, and the file is closed right now. Maybe at a different time, Hashem will say it's time to open it up again. Maybe, you know, one of my one of my rabbis was in the United States uh, in the summer. He'd come every summer. And one of his hobbies, he was now, he was then uh, probably in his 50s. He was a prominent rabbi. But uh, from his childhood, he liked to play basketball. So, you know, he'd teach his classes. And in summertime, you know, he'd take a little break and he would go play basketball. One year, he broke his leg. Broke his leg playing basketball. And he went to his rabbi when he went back to Israel, to his rabbi. And uh, he said to him, what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? The rabbi said, it's time to stop playing basketball. <laughs> Guess what? It's time to stop playing basketball. As you have to know that... Okay, so I want to share with you a couple of very, very important things, okay? Do you realize that one small, little, teeny, tiny seed plants what in 10 years or 20 years will be an enormous tree? One small seed. Guess what? Each one of us are that tree. One little seed, one little change. That Instead of drinking the Coke, even the Coke Zero, take it out. No more. Water. One little thing in the long run, not one year, not one month, maybe 10 years, can change the person forever. One little seed becomes a tree. We can't underestimate the enormity of one small act. So I want to share with you a couple of uh, important, important lessons. We mentioned this previously, but I want to review this because it's so critical. In the temple, there was an altar. And leading up to the altar, there was a ramp. And our sages talk about why is there a ramp? There should be stairs. It's much more practical. Our sages tell us no. You see, and by the way, if you look at how the tabernacle was designed, there isn't really much room for that ramp. It's a, it takes a, a lot of space. And it was noticeable. You look at that, it just like doesn't make any sense. It takes up like almost the whole width of the room. So why don't you just figure out, do a nice spiral staircase. You do something, you know, something fancy. We can do something. It's a temple. It's all gold. You can figure something out. No, a ramp. I say just tell us two things. Number one, it teaches us that you always have to be growing. Why? Because there's no stagnation on a ramp. You're either going up or you're going down. you got to constantly be growing. But there's another thing. Is that on a staircase, it's pre-engineered growth. A staircase represents that there's no customized growth. This is what was engineered, a six and a half inch step between steps, and that's the way it is. And if you're 95 years old and you can't lift up your leg that much, it's too darn bad. Sorry, it's going to be six and a half inches and that's it. And guess what? A little baby is just learning how to walk, can't put lift up their leg either, six and a half inches. And a teenage child, adolescent, they can't do one step either. They jump 14 steps at a time. Well... Our sages tell us pre-engineered growth is not the Jewish way. We're going to have a ramp. And everybody can take their own size step. Someone who can take a small step, take a small step. Someone who can take a large step, take a large step. Take your own size step. There's no pre-engineered growth in Judaism. That's number one. Very important, fundamental principle. The next important thing is that my grandfather during the Yom Kippur War, was asked 
to travel to Egypt to speak to a bunch of officers and soldiers and generals. and So they flew him on a plane to Egypt. And my grandfather looks out the window and he sees that they're like 100 feet above the ground. And he was very concerned and he asks one of the people, he says, oh, is there any difficulty, any problems with our engines? They said, no, there's nothing wrong with the engines. He said, so why are we flying so low? He said, oh, oh no, we're flying below the radar because the radar, Egyptian radars are still working and the radars will detect us if we fly too high and therefore we're flying below the radar so they don't detect us. Grandfather said, you know what the radar is? The radar is the Yetzirah. You know what we need to do? We're that airplane. We need to fly below the radar. When we try to grow, we need to take microscopic steps. Micro steps. Small steps so you don't wake up the Yetzirah. When Yetzirah is looking, who's doing something big? You don't show up on the, on, on the radar. You're flying below the radar. You take something small. Something which is so tiny, it'll say, eh, eh, something too small. It's too small for me to bother with it. So what's the question everyone asks me? Okay, so if today I'm here, it's really below the radar, and tomorrow I take something else and that's below the radar, and then the next day I take something that's below the radar, eventually I'll be above the radar. And then it'll show me down. So that's not the way growth works. What growth Proper growth is that you take something really small and then it becomes part of the essence of who you are. You don't build on top of it. No, it becomes part of who you are. So what you do is you raise the earth. Like it says about Abraham. By Yaakov stay Ephron. Abraham bought the field from Ephron. What happened? Abraham was the highest, the most righteous, the holiest Jew, the holiest person. When he purchased it, the land got elevated. Yeah. The land got elevated because he was elevated. What happens is, what does that mean? It means it responded to a whole new spiritual level. When we change, we're raising the grant, the earth beneath us becomes more elevated. The whole surrounding, everything we do is more elevated. So now that radar just got elevated too with it. And now when you add something and it becomes concretized, it becomes part of who you are, guess what? Now the radar just got elevated more. You keep on raising the surface of, of what don't raise. You're not built. You're not putting one on top of another, on top of another, and then eventually get burnt down. No. Take something small, make it part of you. Take something small again, make it part of you. Take something small, make it part of you. Don't try to take on too much. So one of our participants here, Eliana, is sharing that she imagines that she has the Yetzirah sleeping right on her shoulder. And she takes such a small change in her life that it doesn't wake him up. You know, just something so small, you won't even notice that you're doing it. And I think it's a good, it's a, it's a very, 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 thank you for that. When it's no more work for you. When it's so easy that you don't even have to think twice to take the water instead of the, 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 the Coke Zero. At that point, when it's not even a difficult thing anymore. Because every person is different. For one person, it might be just two weeks and I'm good to go. It's easy. It's not That wasn't a difficult thing. Now, there are some things that will be easy for you and difficult for someone else. But everyone is built on their habits, on their things that they have been uh, cultured by their own intuitions uh, to accept. But it's a very interesting thing. What did Rabbi Kiva teach us? One small drop and another small drop, and another small drop, it transforms. And that's really the way we're trying to change in our lives, by one small drop at a time. With consistency, that's where your success is. One small step at a time. Oh, we're way over time. Okay, I want to just mention this. So many, I have so many notes, so many more notes here. Okay. It says, If you go in my ways of my Torah, and then the the the, ver, the 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 portion of of Bichukotai go on to say all the blessings and the curses, but you know the first, the most important part of the whole thing, Telechu. Telechu means step by step by step. Don't try to jump. If you try to jump, that's where the danger is. You're gonna try to go too much. That's when you fail. 
So if you take a if you take a wall and you drill a little hole in the wall, right? You think it's like so small, but then put a flashlight in it. Put a flashlight against it and see what it projects through the wall. It projects something so much greater. What we're trying to do is make that little hole. Put the light to it. And even though it looks so small, right, a little dime-sized hole, it projects an enormous amount of light. And you know what? Eventually that dime becomes a quarter size. And eventually it becomes a dollar size. And eventually it keeps on growing and growing. We just want to make a teeny little hole. Because that little hole eventually will become something really, really great. Change is organic when we look inside, not when we look outside. Got to look inside. Don't try to compare yourself and don't go on to uh, uh, all the shows that people lost 385 pounds in 20 minutes, right? Don't don't buy it. Don't, don't believe it. And don't buy those medicines that they say you'll wake up in the morning skinny, okay? It doesn't work. Because that's against the nature of this world. The world doesn't exist by instant change. It takes a long time for us to transform who it is that we are. In the, in the Omer, we see we have this concept of counting a one step at a time. Count one day, another day, another day. Eventually, you get to the 49th day and you, you conclude the whole thing. But the idea, again, is reminding us constantly one step process. Intention is everything. Intention to do a mitzvah is as if you've observed the mitzvah. If a person wants it, a person desires it, it's as if you fulfilled that mitzvah. Yeah, you may not have succeeded, but you really wanted it. Eventually, you'll get it. All right, so the most important thing is that we need to remember that in order to grow, we have to look up to Hashem to grow, not step on others to push them down. We never grow by pushing others down. You see something great, you see a good habit that someone has, you could be jealous of that, but don't try to take it 100% and make it yours. You know why? Because that's not you. And as much as we think, oh, it's so simple, you don't know who they are. I'll just share with you one last thing uh, tonight from the Gaona Vilna on Proverbs. He says, no one knows you better than yourself. Be very careful of accepting criticism from another person. You're accepting criticism from another person, guess what? They might be criticizing you because it was something that was easy for them to attain. Why do you get so angry? You should work on your anger. It could be that they were able to work on their anger very easily because anger was a two by them. But you, anger is a ten. It's a lot of work, right? So yes, you should take some uh, mental notice of that uh, statement, but nobody should tell you your growth. We have to get to know ourselves. And God willing, when we resume this series, the Muslim Masterclass, I look forward, we're going to start focusing on some of the negative traits, but... My dear friends, I wish you all, each and every one of us, myself included, everyone who hears this on podcast, those of you who are here live at the center, those of you who are watching on on Zoom, Hashem should bless us all to succeed in our growth in a natural and organic way that is meaningful and hopefully that we should feel and taste the deliciousness of that success. It's not easy. It's not always, you know, boom, I got it and I made that change. Sometimes it can be very difficult. Sometimes we're going to fall and fall and fall like the righteous do. Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vakam tells us the King Solomon. A righteous person falls seven times. That means the natural state of someone who's growing is that they fall. But we get up and we try again. And we get up and we try again. We say, oh, I blew it. Instead of having my water, I ended up drinking a a regular Coke. Can't believe it. You know what? We start again tomorrow. Something small. My dear friends, it's been an awesome privilege. It really has been. This journey of the Muslim Masterclass, and I look forward to continuing it. But my dear friends, have a magnificent evening. Drive safely.
and I look forward to continuing our learning together. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.